I would say trust yourself because you know how to speak, so you know how to play. Greetings everyone, and welcome back to Pep Organ. Today I'm delighted to have a great friend of mine on the show, Ben Adler. Ben is a violinist by profession. He's also the co-founder of Chutney, which is a music ensemble which does focuses on jazz and um, klezmer music. And he's also a music lecturer at the University of New South Wales. Ben, lovely to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So the reason I've brought you onto the show for Pep Organ is that you've developed a philosophy of music that I've found really important and helpful to my own development. So could you summarize it for our listeners, just to start with, in one sentence? Yes, I can summarize music in one sentence. Music is sound that communicates emotional content. Okay, how does that differ to how you've heard it taught before? I've heard it taught and has been taught to me as music is sound. But it's not sound. It's more than sound. Well, it's, it's sound that communicates. And that's the key difference. Okay. So what are teachers not effectively teaching their students right now? Teachers teach their students, and by teachers, I suppose, we're both referring to teachers in institutions such as conservatoria, mm -hmm. uh, formal places of learning, uh, and possibly elsewhere as well. But that's our experience, our mutual experience. Teachers teach students how to make sounds on the instruments. And I suppose they teach those sounds within a tradition of how sounds on those instruments, in those genres, in those styles, have been made uh, over not even more than probably 100 and 150 years or so, if that. Um, and so teachers largely, not exclusively, and there are some notable exceptions, but in our experience, largely teach with the unspoken, probably unthought premise of how can we get our students to make the same sounds that we have made or that we think are good sounds to make? Mm -hmm. And what teachers don't teach is usually, I would say usually, the possibility or the conception or the, the fantasy, God forbid, that perhaps sound has a meaning inside it and therefore it matters less what music sounds like but it matters what music feels like or what music means, which is a paraphrase of one of the great dissenters in the classical music pedagogical scene, Rainer Schmidt, who uh, is probably the greatest classical uh, space uh, voice for this kind of thought, in my opinion, among a few others, who is the second violinist of the Hagen String Quartet and is based in Salzburg and Basel, I think. Mm. So when you talk about music as communication, it goes beyond just creating a sound. Um, it, is it some kind of conversation that is being yeah. had? Do you mind if I give... An example? Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. So, if I had a piano, I would play it, but instead, I'm sure everyone here can picture the opening of, of Beethoven 5. Ba -ba -ba -ba. And would agree that is music. And then, if we just stuck to one note, ba -ba -ba -ba, we'd agree that's still music. And then, if I did this, many would agree that is still music. That could be a timpani line in, in the same piece. But if I did this, now, in some ways, that is quite similar to the previous example. It's just a blunt object falling repeatedly against another object. But the first conveys... Well, how does it make you feel? How does that make you feel? You can immediately feel that there's some anticipation of what's coming. So you don't only hear the knuckles on the wood, you hear a subtext or a meaning, which is the, the point of that sound. Uh, embedded within the sound and that's an emotional, as you said, kind of meaning an anticipation or an excitement or a suspense whereas the falling pen while it also knocks against the wood only communicates the fact of its own falling mm. uh, it doesn't communicate additional meaning emotional meaning beyond its own falling just sounds out there for example, workmen are working right now we hope you can't hear them um, only convey their own working, they don't convey emotional meaning, and that's the difference. So at some point, did you feel that composers and musicians forgot, forgot this, that music should communicate a meaning? I, I do, I honestly do, and um, who am I to say so? Nobody, I recognise that, despite the lovely introduction. Um, but I am someone with a brain uh, and a heart, and I'm not saying either of those are particularly large, but my perspective is that the brain, heart and ears are all that are really required, and we may get there later, but that's why... I think the audience is by far the most mm. important um, party to music, 
and sometimes the unlearned audience, the audience that has not been trained uh, formally in music, is sometimes the, the most useful and relevant arbiter or, or assessor of music. Mm. Um, we'll definitely get to that, yes. but before we jump too closely in, 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 into to that, um, I wanted to ask, because some people might be disagreeing about the, the subjectivity itself of what music is or what it can be, um, do you think that it's possible that music isn't, it, it could be interpreted as any kind of sound because uh, experience is subjective, so people will find meanings in things that you might not, for example? Excellent question. Uh, I can obviously not account for all manner of subjective experiences and responses to sounds. I suppose, without wishing to wade into too difficult territory concerning um, postmodernism and death of the author and intentionality and such, I would draw a line by saying that sounds that have been created with the intention of conveying a meaning um, constitute music. So if it is true that that conveys a huge amount of emotional content to someone, for example, whose divorcing parents would drop pens and therefore that comes with it a certain emotional weight, um, I would call that an emotional sound. I wouldn't call it music because if I have simply dropped a pen by accident, I had no intention to trigger mm. traumatic memories of a listener's childhood, for example. Mm. Um, whereas if this falling motion were conveyed into semiquaver, 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 rest, uh, and you could make a piece out of that, then for sure inspiration derived from a sound, but the sound has been transformed into music. And there are other elements anyway. Um, you asked for a sentence summary and there are several other elements which um, sort of buttress, if that's a verb, what music is and how it can convey meaning, uh, emotional content, uh, beyond simply air being moved in vibrations, which is what sound is. Mm. Um, so I suppose I, I, I would still attempt to draw a line based on the purpose of that sound having been created. Mm -hmm. But I should add that, just to clarify... Um, I'm, I'm a full believer, that's the wrong word, I, I'm, I'm fully committed to the project of subjectivity. And I think this is one of the things that teachers don't teach. Uh, I would never, and I hope I've never, um, asserted or mandated that people feel music in the same way. I do think that there are some ways that it is hard to understand how people could feel music. For example, um, we're going there already, so Bach Chacon, those who don't know, um, a piece actually that he wrote after his wife died. He returned home at the age of 35, uh, and of course there were no um, communications back then of any speed uh, to discover his wife had been buried, and um, he added this huge movement onto an already essentially complete four-movement solo violin partita, and it is deeply emotionally powerful, uh, possibly the most powerful piece that I, I know. Be it mournful, or be it uh, powerful, or be it uh, decrepit, or um, lost, or, or grieving, or that's the same as mournful, I suppose, so you can see where my bias is. But there's a huge corridor, is what I call it, of emotional states that music, the one same bar even, the same piece, the same phrase can inspire and evoke in people. Mm. And um, that's where the subjectivity lies and where I would explore and, in fact, encourage uh, musicians and audience members alike to, to allow their subjective responses to music to, to have full space to, to be. Mm. Yes. This is a dark piece, D minor, and if someone were to think or feel that this was an extraordinarily happy and cheerful, optimistic piece, I would want to have a conversation with them because I don't understand that personally. So my kind of subjective um, de facto logic is that um, there is no one way to hear emotionally a piece of music, mm. but there probably are ways that we can eliminate that one can hear certain kinds of music for various reasons and harmonic um, tension release and, and rhythm and such, which we might get to today if we have time. Well, it's really good that you brought up the Chacon as an example because I was about to talk about what a musical score actually is. Yes. So on the page, the chaconne of being Bach, being from the Baroque period, yes. it's, just, it's just basically notes, isn't it? There's yes. no 
description of what how to feel or how to play it in a certain way. Exactly. Just the title and the, and the notes. Exactly. So what really is a musical score then? Excellent. Um, a musical score can be a couple of different things. I suppose there is a subjectivity here. Uh, for those who um, put the frontispiece of their Baron Reiter editions or text in frames uh, in their practice room, the score is an object of, uh, I would say, idolization, devotion. Um, but I think in a functional way, a fair and also even for them non-exclusive definition is the score is a set of instructions. Um, so basically in the days especially before recording uh, and even with recording, um, those who are fluent in, in reading music are able to glean much more information, I think usually more quickly than having, for example, if you're listening to an orchestral piece, um, there could be up to 20 different parts or whatever. Hard to hear them all, in fact, impossible. I think even Mozart couldn't hear 20 parts at once. Um, on a score, you can see them all at once. Um, doesn't mean you can hear them, but you can see what's going on. So anyway, the score is a way, pre-recording and even with recording, uh, to convey music. And music, as defined before, sounds that communicate meaning. Um, but it is, it is a set of instructions how to make those sounds. Yep. It is not um, a thing in of itself to me. It is, it is a means to an end. It's not the end. Mm. Um, in fact, usually, and I think if I may speak on this briefly, uh, mm. concerning Bach and the absence of instruction, for example, mm. the score is only a beginning. Um, so I might talk about sound language here. Was that a good place or would you talk about it later? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Sound language is the capacity inherent in sound, in the qualities of sound, to convey meaning. Literally what we're doing now. So um, the five sort of aspects are we have pitch, which is going up and going down, or going up and going down. Uh, we have rhythm, timing. We have tone, uh, sometimes called color in music. We have dynamics, that's how loud and soft. And we have articulation, which is the, the cutting or not cutting, the softs or hardnesses of the space between the pitches. Uh, I apologize if that's too technical for some of the I'll listeners. put it on the screen so it's, it makes more sense. Great. But could you um, talk about how the chicon then, uh, sticking on bark, how those would fit into the 100%, sound? 100%. Mm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get there in mm. just a second. Mm. So all those different, let's call them just tenets of sound language, uh, in of themselves and especially in combination, can convey emotional meaning. In music, as in, is in uh, the combination of sounds that composers have written or created in order for us to have emotional experiences. And also, very, very importantly, in speech. So if I raise my voice and speak loudly and fast, there's an excitement or an energy there. If I speak slowly, softly, with soft articulation, whole different emotional content, right? And there are countless other examples I can give. You can say the same sentence in, in five different ways, um, but on the page, on the page, they would be exactly the same. And it's only because of the changes in articulation, dynamics, tone color, etc., that a totally different meaning arises. Um, so for me, an interest, therefore, as Titus is discussing, is how much of sound language of these five tenets does the... Di <laughs> There's a dictator. Does the composer dictate? Um, and I'm not anti-composers, and I'm also a composer, and Titus is a wonderful composer, so this is very much not the, the thesis of this discussion. But, um, and the answer is variable. So in Baroque times, and beautifully now also in jazz times, so there's been a bit of a sort of circuitous path to a similar place over a couple of centuries, um, the only aspects of sound language that are dictated by the score really are pitch, uh, and even then, there, it was maybe 95% because there was an acceptance that there would be some improvisation or ornamentation, as it was largely known, uh, in places, certainly at, at cadence points and other places, uh, and rhythm and timing, but not even timing because there were no written in um, ritardandi, which means to slow down, or accelerandi, which means to speed up. That, that wasn't included in the score as it was 100 years later uh, or so. Um, so really, you had most of pitch... Rhythm, not timing, especially. Um, if you're lucky, you might get a piano, which means soft, or a forte, which means loud, once or twice in a piece. And sometimes you might get a slur, which means on violin, at least you play in, in one bow, or other instruments that you play connected. Um, 
you, you wouldn't find anything else. In the Chacon, you find nothing else um, except for the name, Chacon. And so what, what is left, what is not included? Well, as mentioned, the elements of uh, pitch uh, and rhythm, especially timing, um, the vast majority of articulation, and then entirely tone color and the vast majority of dynamics are left to the performer's, I might say, discretion. But I suppose that sounds maybe a little bit too open-ended. I would like to just uh, add a caveat here. They are informed by the sound language elements and harmony and energy, etc., that are embedded within the score. So there are articulation and tone color decisions that I would make in the Chacon, not based on how I feel that day necessarily or based on my personal whimsy, or, but based on the content that I already see. And I think a good sort of analogy here is clues or hints that a detective must then sort of look through to find and understand. Um, from which I can then construct the complete picture. Mm -hmm. However, to say that the performer has nothing to do because the score is finished and perfect, we might talk about Heifetz, mm -hmm. um, is also a fallacy because, and we can also discuss this with reference to scores in later periods where more information was packed onto the score. Mm -hmm. The score is clearly, as discussed, only uh, a set of instructions. The idea that sound that communicates meaning can be conveyed fully in a two-dimensional dots and dashes on, on a paper is, is absurd. And so the discretion I've therefore um, described concerning how individual artists may, um, you could say, interpret or may fill out the rest of those tenets that are not specified in the score uh, is not purely free. So a lot of um, musicians really like playing Baroque or jazz because of the freedom that they see because the score is so empty. There's so much you can do with it. But when we get to later periods, well, the period of the Romantic era, 19th century, we start to see that the score starts to get, get more and more dense, more and more black pieces of markings on, on them telling you what to do, more articulation, instructions, and so on. And I think that today, uh, musicians feel that they're obligated to follow all of the instructions. There's a, a needing, need to uh, follow the, cons the control of the composer. And so... Do you think that that's something we have to take seriously? Is that, is that what all the things that the composer writes, especially when it's down to the finest detail? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I have a couple of responses. Uh, the first one is both a sort of epistemological, which means like thinking about knowledge from a, a, a back state, um, like behind the scenes, and also has a practical element, which is the following. Instead of just diving into a piece by Schumann, uh, it might be worth asking the question... As a musician, as an artist, how are you approaching Schumann? And how are you approaching your own craft and career? Uh, is it to play a piece by Schumann in the context of a uh, recital in Sydney Recital Hall, um, Angel Place, with Beethoven and bits and pieces, Schubert, whatever, and to people who have heard this music before? If so, the way that you interpret the markings, which are more extreme, as mentioned, on the score, will be quite different to if you wanted to play Schumann as a jazz chart, by which, uh, easily done, find the melody, which is in the right hand or in the violin part, if it's a sonata or whatever, uh, usually, uh, and then just work out the chords, write them out as symbols, and then just jam on that. That is a beautiful thing. I've done this. Um, I, I'm not sure if we've done this together, but it's it's... That's also, I mean, music is free. No, I mean, copyright is an exception, obviously, but Schumann is dead more than 75 years, so mm. it doesn't apply. Uh, music is free. Music is sounds put together. People should be, uh, and I would encourage, and de facto are, uh, there's no police, thankfully, at least in this country, music police. So, <laughs> sure, if, but, but, but if, if you were to play Schumann as a jazz chart, um, does that sort of violate what the emotional content of it's a good piece is. Good question. Yeah. So I think the biggest violation in that context would be to audiences not expecting it, which is why I said you need to have considerations to, right. to whom, for whom, and why one is playing the music. Mm -hmm. um, there is an argument to say that it's unethical to the dead composer who clearly um, wanted to write the music in a certain way. Um, I don't really care. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I'm unethical. It just doesn't matter. He's dead and the music is here and, and that's the end of the story. Yep. Um, in terms of the, the question that you asked specifically, is it the best way to reify um, the emotional content embedded? Um, there's no one answer, honestly. I suppose 
I would put a question back to you and your listeners. Have you ever listened to, for example, Rachmaninov play Rachmaninov? There's no particular reason, and as a composer I say this myself, uh, and I'm, I think perhaps you might agree, yes. just because one has put the music down or has sort of conceived of the sequence of notes and harmonies in one's head and then put it on paper, uh, and so therefore birthed the collection of sequences of notes, doesn't mean that you either have ownership of it or even have the best, or only, put it that way, the only understanding mm. of how to convey them with an emotional way. And let me explain how this works. So each, this is not really so much jazz, but I think it's important to say, each one of us is um, a, a complex product of years of experiences. And as a consequence of which, and this is a little bit postmodern here, we each um, are and have a lens by and through which we um, imbibe the world around us and therefore also through which we convey creative product. Mm -hmm. So therefore to say, for example, back to this Schumann idea of, of the Romantic period, mm -hmm. that if Schumann has written a love song and he has certain ideas as to how love can operate, for example, he has big long phrases, he thinks the best way to feel in love is to have total smoothness, whereas others may feel excited and jittery by love and therefore may not want to have a very, very long legato phrase but may want to have elements within that are more articulated, for example. Who's to say that's wrong? Um, who's to say that Schumann's way of expressing love is the only way? So I would argue that I think it's worthwhile investing in what a composer in the Romantic period has put in the score to determine which aspects are sort of the product of his or her own um, personal lens mm. and that are therefore able to pop, perhaps to be substituted out with aspects of one's own personal lens and which parts are fundamental to the piece. The fundamental is the emotional content itself, whether it's, it's love or, or hatred or excitement or, or envy. Or, and obviously, beautiful thing about classical music is that these emotions can change within, within half a bar. And so to understand the meaning of the music is key. If there are elements like staccatos here or semi staccatos, you know, mezzo staccatos, the tenuto dash line, and exactly how long those things should be compared to others. Uh, and if those elements don't... But I think the point is that it doesn't... You don't want to get tangled in the details. It's exactly. more about what the purpose of these markings is. And mm. that's one of the other responses, I think, is the second third response to this point that I wanted mm. to make. Yeah. In my experience as a student, uh, personally, that this happened to me, um, when so much care is given to details, markings, articulations, mm. often especially, mm. and dynamics, um, the fact is that humans are limited. Uh, and, you know, none of us here are stupid people, but we are not infinite beings. Uh, and if a certain amount of attention is given to the slavish, fidelious reification of every minute articulation, which is exactly, exactly what a lot of classical musicians do, and there's a huge school, especially the historically informed performance practice sort of school, about reading treatises and manifestos by Leopold Mozart and who knows who, right, about exactly how long a staccato and then the, the wedge-type staccato and the semi-staccato, and, and then they work out not to the millisecond, but, you know, with a lot of precision as to exactly yeah. how long they should be. And then there are sort of answers, the objective, commodified, scientific answers to all these questions, what they mean. If so much attention is given to, again, this comes back to how this conversation started, how the music sounds, it's impossible to spend sufficient attention and energy on what the music means. Mm. So that is my big cautionary uh, advice, I suppose, to people who are where I was five, ten years ago, mm. going through the con um, and being beleaguered with all this insistence to uh, pay excruciating attention to the detail of markings, uh, pay attention and observe them and determine which are fundamental to the meaning, but never ever let that become the, the chief objective when one performs, yeah. because then it's impossible to make meaning and make emotion. Well, your example about Rachmaninoff is perfect for this, because um, you're, you're not saying that we shouldn't study to some degree techniques, uh, historical treatises that might give us an insight into some things that go beyond the page and meanings and interpretations, but there's more to it. There's the actual ends-based ends purpose of the uh, performance. And I think that uh, Rachmaninoff was a great example because 
we have to acknowledge that even with these uh, composers who are obsessed with detail, uh, that the performance that they give might not be the final word. And likewise, with old treatises like Leopold Mozart, he might have not followed them himself. He might have changed the rules based on his audience or based on if it was a rainy day. Could, anything could change. And yeah. I, I think that that's a really good thing to keep in mind. Can I give you a small example for my... Sure, well, yeah. So I haven't composed much. I'm no composer like Titus, who, who's truly an astonishing composer. But I, I've written a little bit for my band Chutney. Um, one song called Rivers of Gold, which was like a, a, a sad, love-sick, love-broken, heartbroken kind of ballad. And I had a very clear conception as to how it would go. Um, the tempo and, and the, the tone and the form, like even the form, like when to repeat which verse of chorus and things. And I took it to the band, and the band had different ideas. And, it's, and then the singer had different ideas. And now it has evolved so far beyond what I had imagined, and I can honestly say it is so much better. As a composer, I am so grateful for the sort of co-composition and recomposition um, process. And from my perspective, it is still very, very, very much my piece, and everyone in the band would agree, because I put together the combinations of melody, pitch, harmony, um, and I conveyed, buried within this combination of notes, etc., um, the feeling of, of heartbrokenness or whatever, um, which has been absolutely respected and uh, interpreted so beautifully by all members of my band and the singer. Um, but the exact ways, if I, this, the, the, the legatos, the tempos, the instrumentation, etc., um, have all changed. You didn't try to dictate that. Well, at first I did because I thought I knew what I wanted. Okay. And my band, but I suppose I didn't have it all written out perfectly in the score. I had basically a jazz chart with, with notes here and there. For me, certainly, it was a consequence of having excellent relationships with the musicians in, in my circle and then trusting them um, and, and going along with their ideas and discovering that their way of manipulating sound language to convey the nominated emotions that I had conveyed uh, and embedded within the piece were not only uh, valid, but from my perspective, better and more powerful than my own. Wow, fantastic. So it's, it's a collaborative process as well. In that, in that Why, not? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why mm. not? So it's really good to keep in mind for our listeners that, that composers don't need to prescribe everything. They can leave freedom to the, to the listener, to the performer. And that as performers, we also have a lot of freedom on our hands, the freedom to make all sorts of interpretive decisions about music. So obviously then you have composed a piece of music that was malleable or adaptable to certain circumstances, even if not originally intended to be. Um, I really think there's so much um, opportunity that isn't being utilized by composers today for this level of freedom. So I know a few composers. Um, my, my friend Graham Twist is a good example, who viewers of the channel will know. Uh, he doesn't write too many instructions into his piece. A few registration instructions for the organ, you know, about tone color and, and dynamics, but leaves a lot of freedom to the performer uh, by leaving it pretty blank. And I think that there's a real chance to revive this spirit of, that came from jazz and is still present in jazz, that we could even, you know, let go of all the counterpoint and all of the close voice, voice writing and things, which is essential for orchestral compos uh, compositions, but not so much for a solo performance. Mm. And uh, do you think that there's a way we can bring that back mm. into com the, composition? The, the caveat I would uh, add is that it relies upon musicians to have the capacity that you do to understand the meaning when they look at a score. And, you know, there's a chicken or egg conversation here. Um, which element should or needs to or can change uh, in the musical status quo in order to return to a space of freedom in Baroque or to imbibe the spirit of jazz uh, freedom that is vested sort of collaboratively also in the performer? Do we need to change pedagogy or do we need to change what pedagogues receive in the form of scores? Not really sure. I do think that there is a risk that if one gives a very blank score to uh, a schooled um, graduate of the conservatorium who has not understood, has not had the chance to learn, has not discovered for themselves what we are talking about here, that music has meaning, they will play it in a very boring way. Or indeed, if it is so loose that there aren't even necessarily complete parts written out, they'll have no idea. Most of my classical friends cannot read a jazz chart. Jazz chart, for those who don't know, is simply melody and chords, but chords written as symbols. So you, as a pianist, for example, can choose 
how to play a G major chord. Do you have a G in the bass and then a B or D? Do you, do you have them all up here closely? Do you, do you have it in the first inversion, etc.? Do you add a seventh for jazz or ninth? You can add all these things. So most classical musicians that I know freak out, literally. I've had people panic in gigs because they have no idea what to do with these things, so I have to swap it back for a piece that has every note written. Most classical musicians can only read notes that are given to them. They have no capacity to even relinquish that degree of closeness from the score, let alone understand the metaphoric or um, emotional meaning within the score. Um, it's possible, hypothetically, that if all scores became loose in this manner, like that, musicians would have to change, and there might be a sort of self-selecting process whereby musicians who couldn't keep up with that change would end up going off and, without wish to be rude, or becoming actuaries <laughs> or accountants or yeah. some kind of place which has very clear answers because that's what these musicians seek, just a simple answer. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I would definitely encourage composers to, to do that and I think it's uh, just for their own learning so they can then engage with performers yeah. and collaborate and see what comes and maybe it might be a disaster. What have you lost? You've lost nothing. Mm. Um, in other times, if a composer has an incredibly clear vision of what they want, um, then sure, put down in paper and then see what a performer brings out and then also, again, have a conversation with them. Uh, be at a rehearsal and perhaps see, well, you know, the performer may suggest, you know, I, I get that you're trying to bring out the grief here or the love or whatever. I would like to break this slur, see what you think, and then maybe you may have a different conception. If a performer, however, in that context of a very, very clearly written, uh, detailed score, um, doesn't have a conversation about the meaning and simply says I don't like playing so many notes in a bow because I think it sounds weak or, or something then you're with the wrong performer because by the same token a performer that simply is only thinking in terms of um, how sound sounds and how well they can sound on their instrument whatever uh, is not a performer worth their salt from my perspective it's not, it's not a performer that one wants to engage with so sometimes I would say just to sort of flip the coin a little bit um, even where a composer uh, has a conception of sound as meaning, which probably many composers do, and has put a lot of detail in the score, sometimes the performer can let them down because the performer may only sure. want to sound good, sure. not to actually sound meaningful. Mm -hmm. So it's a collaborative effort is my kind of answer. You've got to a really good point that I want to bring up because um, especially in the organ scene, in religious institutions, you may have performers, musicians who are not highly trained or not, not you know, not gone through university and they may think of themselves that oh, I'm not a real musician I'm, I'm, I'm not I can't do all the things that you're saying um, what kind of tips or advice could you give to a musician who doesn't feel like they have the technical prowess mm, mm. but they still want to communicate emotion and meaning through their performance for sure uh, the, the first thing is which I should have made clear when I discussed sound language for the first time is that none of us went to conservatoria to learn how to speak we all picked it up at the age of three or four, or whatever, five, mm -hmm. um, from our parents and people at preschool. And now, universally, we all understand that if you go up, there's an uncertainty, maybe you're asking a question, and if you come down, we have a statement. That is the end. For example, no, literally no one has ever been told that. We've all picked it up, and everyone does it. There are very, very few people in the world, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, because I can't really speak for many other languages, I can speak a little bit about Hebrew, and very similar uh, in terms of these inflections and such, but... Um, I understand that tonal languages, maybe Kim could give us information about that, have a sort of different relationship with pitch. But let's leave that aside for now, okay? Romance languages, uh, at least. Um, we can discuss the universality of the understanding that is unschooled, untaught, of how sound language works. So therefore, to these amateur, for want of a better word, um, musicians, I would say, trust yourself. Because you know how to speak, so you know how to play. Um, now, obviously, there are some pieces that are technically hard, uh, I would say if you can't play them technically, avoid them. Okay. Unless you have an intention to become a better technical player and go off and do your scales and studies and practice slowly and then go to a teacher who can tell you where your tension lies and how to blah, 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 blah. Uh, unless you have an intention to do that, don't play things that are beyond your capacity because then you'll only end up playing notes. Unless you want to play notes, in which case you can. But if you want to make music, you can't be playing just notes, just making sounds. You have to be comfortable enough with the act of making sounds in the same way that we, having not written scripts for this conversation, are comfortable enough using our mouth and tongues and such in order to make the sounds such that we don't have to think about how we are moving our mouths. We only think about and feel the meaning we're conveying and the rest is done for us automatically. The point of technique, for those who are not aware, 
is for it to become automatic. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that really helps. And I wanted to ask then about, because you're a violinist, um, and you've on the violin you can manipulate pitch, tone color, dynamics so easily. Mm. Um, but of course, the organ is, is very different to the violin. It's true. <laughs> you've described it before as being quite limited um, in that you, you cannot manipulate pitch easily. Um, you can only change tone color with stop changes, so taking your hands off the keys and so on, or dynamics. Uh, I like to think about the organ as being more like an orchestra in the way that it, 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 it performs. So it, it may be limited in certain aspects, but with its incredible dynamic range, mm. it sort of makes up mm. for that. Um, what do you think about that and the, the sort of emotional communicative techniques that an organist could use? 100%. I think that's a really good analogy. I think the orchestra and the organ have a lot of similarities. I think they're both very limited, um, dare I say, compared to something like a solo violin uh, or... Um, any string instrument for that matter, which has yeah huge flexibility concerning articulation, pitch, um, uh, tone in mm. particular, um, but has a huge advantage uh, in terms of dynamics. Um, you can get incredibly loud in a way that a single violin never ever. That's why there are twenty six violins in an orchestra and only mm. one organ, right? Um, and I suppose tone color variation operates in a very different way for you guys, in that you don't have. Uh, a gradation in the way that I can, by moving my bow centimeters, can can have a sliding spectrum of, of sounds from from very fluffy and, and light to, to very intense. But you have how many different colors? How many different stops? You have twenty. How many? Uh, yeah, as sometimes fifty or hundred. Yeah, right. So in the same way that I mean, I I don't, I don't think I have a hundred colors. I'll put it that way. I, I don't think I have a hundred colors in the violin. <laughs> I don't think I have fifty. Um, whereas you do, uh, and the orchestra also because of its various combinations of. I mean, think about it. If, if you have 25 or whatever different unique instruments in the orchestra, violin, oboe, piccolo, whatever, yeah. then the computations, the, what is it, 25 factorial or whatever, That's right. you know, it's a huge number, huge yeah. number. Uh, and that, again, affects volume. Mm. Um, what the orchestra can't do is, is, is be, and this is different to the organ because um, there are like 70 people or whatever in the orchestra, it can't have a very spontaneous, very whimsical, um, very fine and subtle alteration of timing. So the conductor is there to try to suggest ways, but to try to get 70 people to spontaneously, it's hard enough as a string quartet, and it's possible, but with a lot of uh, rehearsal and very clear leadership, but to have the back desks you know, <laughs> 20 metres away following, uh, and the way that I can, obviously with solo or when I'm playing um, with yourself as a pianist or people who understand each other well in the quartet, that's impossible, but there are other advantages to an orchestra. So, so back to you about the organ. Um, I definitely think that every instrument, every combination of instruments should find and invest time, and it's not very hard, to think about the strengths that that instrument or combination of instruments has in terms of sound language, and I think you've identified them spot on. Mm. Uh, the organ is the supreme harmonic instrument because you've got three voices, you know, and you've got huge bass, and then and so much of harmony is also the in interrelationship counterpoint-wise between... Um, melody and bass, no one does better than the organ. And then all, every chord, you, you, the way you can voice chords, you can have like seven, eight, ten note chords, can't you? Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's still an element of meaning there because the harmony is conveying what I call a, a tension and then a release. A tension and a release. And that in of itself has a kind of energy and a kind of momentum. I call it a grammar, actually. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that... Like we have. Tonic dominant. Yes, exactly. So we have tonic, which is home. We have predominant, which is going through places. Then we have uh, dominant, which is called five, which is the furthest away point. And then we have back to home, which is actually, for me, similar to... So dog, tonic, kills, dominant, cat, tonic. That's the basic sentence structure, uh, nominative verb accusative. Dog, tonic, with its sharp claws, predominant, at midnight, predominant, out of jealousy, predominant, killed, dominant, cat, tonic. So there, there's a grammar there. Even if you read those words uh, in a book, that's what novels are, right? Or poetry, um, if it's not recited. There is meaning conveyed there, and not just simply the words, but also the, the, the emotionality. The, the more predominant chords, specifically here, yep. which are really the juicy chords, is if you only play 1-5-1-5, one, five, one, five, you end up with a lot of music, actually. <laughs> you don't end up with very, very exciting, interesting music. The predominance is where all the juice happens. And so if you read a sentence with the sharp claws at midnight, etc., you would feel something. And that's a, So even if those chords are played with zero intention 
for emotional um, conveyance. One can feel emotion. This is the wonderful thing. This is sort of the miracle here uh, in a way that... And that's how orchestras often work because I don't think most orchestras have a unanimous understanding of any of what we're talking about. In fact, to the contrary, and I'm with the greatest respect to friends of mine who <laughs> play in orchestras, um, they don't feel this way at all. They, they disagree, in fact, quite strongly with a lot of what we're talking about here. They think music should just be sounds that are made well and the composer's direction should be observed uh, blindly and verbatim and there's nothing more that the performer has to do. That's literally what we're taught and what a lot of people... And that's how also auditions are run for orchestras, just who can most, with most fidelity reify um, the, the part written down. Um, but when those things are combined, all those parts playing perfectly according to the score, what ends up with tone, color, and volume, but also like um, dynamics, harmony, and the harmony itself, um, then combined with the cymbal crash, and combined with tremolo high, you know, whatever, and you're going to get, no matter how individually uninvested every player is in the conveyance of the motion, mm. these things work, mm. and so harmony works, so the organ has a huge advantage over the solo violin, for example, which can play chords, example in the Chacon, I keep saying Chacon, <laughs> but much, much, much better harmonic instrument than anything out there. And then we can manipulate the, the, the timing better because we're a single player. Yeah, than an, an orchestra for sure you can. Yeah. Mm. Now what about visual presentation? Because um, when you play the organ, of course, sometimes you're completely hidden from view because of, in the church it might be hidden away, but sometimes the organ is visible, the console and the performer. Um, now, when you play the violin, you're always there's also a body language that goes into the way that you communicate to the audience. Could you talk a bit more about that? For sure. The best, by which I mean the most uh, powerful, most memorable um, musical experiences I've had as an audience member, have 100 percent those been those in which my eyes have been closed, um, and not not because I couldn't see, or not because there was any other reason why I wanted to close my eyes, except that it felt right to do so because the sounds being produced by these masterful musicians were so replete, saturated with emotional meaning that I didn't need or want anything else. That I wanted to, and hence, you know, the, the adage, which I think is the truth, that the blind person hears better. You know, by removing one sense, I was able to glean, pick up more of the emotional content coming to me through sound. And that's all I wanted to do. So it was a very involuntary and very necessary Sometimes thing. Sometimes you listen to a performance with your eyes closed. So. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, yeah. Th and that's a test for me. Not that I consciously test myself, but that is, in retrospect, a test. If it's been an outstanding performance, a stellar performance, I will close my eyes. Um, so I would encourage audiences to not worry too much, perhaps, about whether they can see someone or not, and to try hearing the sound as the full picture. Um, I suppose I would just suggest that music is communication of sound, of meaning through sound, so it is a sound-based enterprise. Um, a great, or an effective musician who is free physically uh, and whose physicality with the instrument enables them to be, will be physically mobile and expressive in um, the way that they, as a physical being, is resonating naturally with the expression of the content that they um, are engaged with at the moment. And if that natural resonation, resonance, physically, um, assists a listener in understanding and imbibing and feeling the emotional content, full power to the listener. If, as for me, it doesn't, because I, if I'm listening to a great artist, just want to experience the sound as fully as possible, full power to people like me, it's, it's, it's a free-for-all. Mm, mm. Ben, it's been a real joy to have you on the, on the show and to talk about all sorts of different aspects of what music is all about. Just before I finish, I have one more question to ask you. Um, knowing that you play klezmer music, jazz, classical, obviously you feel that you can f derive meaning from any genre of music. Would that be true? 100%. Mm. But we find today that the most dominant um, genre of music is, is pop music. So, and it seems like the most popular music that people listen to is always the newest. And do you know why that might be, or mm. why pop has, is, has become the most popular mm. form? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I don't have a full answer, but I have some hints at an answer, perhaps. Dance has always been a popular thing. Um, folk dances have existed forever. A lot of folk music is dance. Not all of it. Some is lullabies, which yep. is song, or even spoken. Um, all pop music 
and they call it pop pop songs because there are singers involved. But all pop music in this conception is dance mm-hmm. because there is a absolutely relentless beat. Um, I've, having recorded pop music, you know, you put it in a click track. It's just a metronome in your ears, so you keep recording perfectly to it. There's, there's no rubato, which is uh, give and take in timing. Um, so that part of sound language is out. Um, I would say there's a relatively low threshold required in terms of what um, the musician and the artist and the composer, whatever, needs to do to grab the listener and bring them in. You just need a beat. Especially because, you know, a lot of music is, is used functionally these days at the gym, going for runs, um, doing house chores, certainly, obviously, uh, going out. So, so people who are not us go out on Friday and Saturday nights, so we've been out last night or yeah. whatever, um, and, they have, and then they dance or, or they drink. Or a combination of these things I've been told, right? Mm-hmm. So y- you have to dance to dance music. And that's... So these spaces are often physically active spaces. They're not, I would say, I think it's fair to say, deeply reflective spaces where one can have sort of cathartic experiences uh, uncovering grief by listening again to Bach Chacon, for example. Mm-hmm. They're not those spaces. They're spaces where actually, to be frank, people can sometimes escape from whatever's happening in the world instead of engage with it in the way that... I think classical music especially is very gifted at has a great capacity to do escape by just getting into a groove I like what you said about this lower threshold to, to entry to, to enjoy pop music because we all feel that innate beat the pulse we have a heartbeat too mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. whereas you may say that, that classical music is, it takes more effort mm. or more, more reflection to appreciate mm. well yes every ad Every every train, every, every reception, doctor's waiting room has pop music going, has a beat. So it's it's an unusual thing, a truly unusual thing for people who are not classically inclined or have any interface with music to hear music that doesn't have a perpetual beat. Yeah. Uh, and I think the socialization fact is is uh, unavoidable and um, sort of renders any data that we can try to assess in terms of the ease of of approaching non-beat music a little bit redundant yeah. um, but I would say to answer your question that yes I think given this given the socialization of pop music of beated music I think it does require a level of exposure therapy to classical music mm. it's hard to actually engage emotionally with that music because there's so much novelty and so much foreignness yeah. so there is a level of a threshold which we would have received quite early I think from our parents of hearing enough classical music mm. to then be able to engage with classical music in a way that I think it should and can, which is emotional. And I think everyone can. I don't, I don't believe that there's only certain types of people who... And that's what I've found also playing classical music in an expressive way, as I've done with my string quartet for the past year, to people who've never heard it before in their lives. And they've come, they've wanted to listen, they've uh, been in dark space, there's sort of fake candles in the background, and that maybe helps them, but they actually come away saying, you moved me to tears. Uh, and there was no beat, and there, was, there were no lyrics, mm-hmm. and there was no sex. It was... It was sound conveying emotional content so I maybe I sound a bit of an idealist here but in my anecdotal experience I think it is true at least success stories do exist for that way that people who've had no socialization or no exposure to classical music can actually get it and understand it emotionally but I think often it does require an, an, a level of exposure a sort of hump that needs to be overcome and I don't think that's a problem mm. brilliant answer <laughs> thank you so much so just to summarize then, music is communication, communication of meaning, and we achieve this through sort of being, being a detectives, looking at the score for assistance. If we're composers, we uh, need to be flexible and, and understand that it's the performer's role as additionally to put meaning into the, into the work. To understand meaning and then add ways to express that meaning. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Really a pleasure to have you on the channel. Pleasure. Thanks, Titus. Take care.